questions. All right, so this is the third session in the Revelation class. Uh, let's open with a prayer. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, you truly are the, uh, the Lamb who has been slain for our sins, and through your blood we are purchased to be your own. We pray, bless your church here on earth, so that what we read and study today could become for us a source of encouragement, uh, wisdom, and boldness, so that we would serve you without fear for men, and proclaim your truth in this darkening world. And we pray that you would so keep and guide us that at the end we all would be rejoicing around your throne in the new Jerusalem, where there is no more sin, death, or darkness. In Jesus' your name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right, so um, today's lesson is chapters 4 and 5. And uh, we are sort of continuing a little bit with things we didn't have time to go through last time. As you remember, we sort of started running out of time there. And there's a neat detail with the last two uh, letters to congregations, which repeats there uh, and then it links those letters actually to the chapters we are going through today. So it's, it worked out quite well. So we can then begin with that kind of background things and then go into the text for today. Just a comment about the two and three. They were talking to us in those letters. Right. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's. I could see them talking to me. Yeah. I think that's that's a very fruitful way of reading them. Both as an individual level, we can say that as Christians we recognize things there, but also as members of congregations, that our churches, our situations in our in our congregations are often very similar. I I guess it's it's possible in this fallen world that you can combine every letter somehow into yourself, and you know a person who is sometimes um, you know cool, uh, cool and uncaring can be at some time, then again full of zeal, so we, we fluctuate. But indeed, that's, that's good a uh, good way to read them. We talk sometimes with a little bit of a uh, difficult word, theophany, which means revelation of God, or God's appearances, especially in the Old Testament. It's common, you know, it's, it's related to Epiphany, the Feast of Epiphany, also Revelation of God. In Old Testament, there's, you could roughly say that there's two kinds of encounters between God and man, or God and prophet, or moments when God reveals himself. Where there are instances where God, or an agent of God, like an angel or something like that, would appear in the midst of earthly life of the prophet. Uh, that God would come into this everyday going and uh, coming and going of our our world and make an appearance there. If we think of examples, it could be Abraham who was just minding his own business in Mamre, and then these three mysterious gentlemen show up who turn out to be God probably God himself. Or we can remember uh, Moses in the, uh, in the wilderness of Sinai seeing a very ordinary bush, which actually is then a flame and not being consumed. So it's in the normal day-to-day -day wilderness where a shepherd might be, he sees God. Or, or Elijah, who goes into a cave and hears God's voice there. So there are these instances where, where we can, I mean, there's multiple, you, you can just list more of them. There's these moments of theophany where God somehow breaks through into the mundane and everyday and, and, and gives a message, and often, often calling people to his service. And then there are instances where 
it goes other way around. It's not God coming to their day-to-day -day life, but rather, for a moment, they are swept up from their uh, present realities into some sort of ecstatic vision of God. And we can remember those, for example, from Ezekiel 1, the calling of Ezekiel, or Isaiah 6, also calling of Isaiah. So where they get a, a, a grand vision of God's glory and his power and his might, they see angels and, and, and chariots and flames and thunder and everything, so it's, it's nothing they have ever seen. And through these kind of theophanies, these two types, you could say, God calls his prophets to serve him in a special manner. Or, for example, in case of Elijah, strengthening him in the task he has already been given. They are called to act as God's instruments in revealing his will and word to others. In the book of Revelation, we could see both kinds of, of theophany take place. We have the first type where God appears in the middle of ordinary business. In the first chapter, we don't know exactly what John is doing, but he's probably not preparing himself for an uh, amazing vision. He is at Patmos, he's doing what, whatever he's doing, and then, without forewarning, he hears a trumpet sound, uh, and, and he turns and he sees the resurrected Christ in his glory. So that's, that's the first type, in the middle of normal life. Uh, and, and then the second type is what we're going to be looking at today, where the prophet is taken into God's presence in some heavenly realm, and he is allowed to see God uh, in his full glory. And these chapters 4 and 5 we are studying today, they actually link Revelation very strongly with experiences of Isaiah and Ezekiel. So you remember that Revelation is constantly, you could say, discussing with the Old Testament uh, prophets. And this kind of chapter, we now see the 4 and 5, this is really showing how Revelation stands in the same uh, chain of prophets as the Old Testament prophecies. And it begins with a similar kind of vision where John is taken, taken into the same place where Ezekiel and, and Isaiah both receive their missions. In both Isaiah and Ezekiel, God is shown in his divine glory. And there are some similarities between the calling of these two prophets, and also in relation to Revelation 4 and 5. And this will maybe make a little bit more sense when we uh, read the text itself. Uh, what is characterized in this uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah is that God is depicted on the throne. That's a, a big sim symbol. It signifies his rule. God is always the one who sits on the throne. He's surrounded by angels and other creatures, cherubim and seraphim, who continually sing his praise. And then God himself is, in these visions, hidden from the eye, with no description or only very minimal description uh, of the actual person on the throne. Instead, the glory of God is shown in thunder, fire, wind, uh, light, or such, all coming from his throne. But the one who actually sits on the throne is never really described. Uh, the best you can get to is, is you see the robes. His robes fill the temple. That's about as close as you can get. What is on the throne is hidden. And that really fits with the idea of God living in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. And God's appearance then creates a response in the prophet, awe or even dread. They fall on their face. Isaiah cries, O oh, woe to me, uh, I am I'm perishing. Uh, God's glory creates this sort of response, as we remember also from uh, beginning of Revelation, John has already gone through it, that he fell down like dead. So how do then Revelation 4 and 5 uh, link with the letters? In the 
beginning or oh, the end of chapter three, we have two congregations that kind of make a couple, in the sense that um, the Philadelphia, which is the second to last, it's the only congregation who actually doesn't get any kind of rebuke from Christ. It's the congregation that seems to have done. Spot on. And then the Laodicea is the only congregation who doesn't get any kind of understanding or, or any kind of um, uh, affirmation, but simply complete rejection. <coughs> Although, of course, also with a call to repent, so that they also have a way back. And what is interesting is that those, uh, there's one element with this both congregation, and that is the door. Um, to uh, Philadelphia it is written Behold I have said he, First Christ says I am the one who has the key of David Who opens and no one will shut Who shuts and no one opens I know your works Behold I have set before you an open door Which no one is able to shut So there is a door But it's not really described what it is Then we go into Laodicea and there we read at the end, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. So Philadelphia has an open door, and Laodicea had a closed door, and Christ was standing, hoping it could be opened. In the case of Laodicea, the door has to do with the presence of Christ among his congregation. So the, the idea of the door is developed further. Jesus wishes to enter his church. He is standing as if outside Laodicea. He is outside the congregation, on the door, wanting to get in. And you could say that the figure itself is showing how far Laodicea had fallen away, and how patient Christ actually is. He is standing on the door of his own house. He's standing on the door of his own church, asking them to let him in. If Laodicea would open the door, then Christ says he would enter and eat with them. And now that's the, that's the thing, is that what does it mean when a church eats with Jesus, or sits down for a meal with Jesus? The Lord's Supper. I mean, it's that's. It doesn't require a whole lot of imagination to make that connection. That what does it mean when a congregation sits down for a meal with Jesus? It's pointing to the Lord's Supper, where we share a meal with the resurrected Christ. For some reason or another, we don't exactly know why. Laodicea had fallen so far that they did not even have proper sacrament anymore. Maybe they had something instead, but they didn't have Christ amongst themselves anymore. If they would repent, however, Jesus would again eat with them. It's good to know that this is one of those verses where, where you can see the application or the interpretation in, in pious Christian devotional language is, uh, is very different from the, the way the, the text actually is meant. Um, all this Let's not go into the whole theology of that, but this whole idea that Jesus stands on the door of your heart, knocking and asking you to take him in. Now, that's, that's maybe a beautiful picture, but that's not what this letter is talking about. This is, this is not talking about an individual person letting Jesus into their hearts, but rather it's talking about the congregation which is called to hear the word of Christ and open the door, not the door of their heart, but rather the door of their congregation, so that Jesus comes in and becomes the Lord of that table again, so that then, then they can have proper supper with him. Now then we go into chapter 4, uh, and it begins, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And that kind of catches your interest when you have already this remembrance of Philadelphia and Laodicea. 
that these congregations in, in Asia, Jesus is speaking and they have in their churches a door, which in Philadelphia was open in Laodicea because of their unbelief had been shut, but hopefully could be opened again. And that door somehow uh, gets Jesus into that congregation or shuts him out if, if it's closed. And now then we see a vision of a door opened into heaven. Well, okay, that's where Jesus is, right? He's in heaven, so that's where he comes through. And, and we've got to understand that uh, what we now are about to see in the chapters 4 to 5, it must be understood in connection with the letters. We are now about to see what each of those congregations had amongst them, because they had the door into this, what we are about to see. So each of the congregations, except Laodicea, which had barred their door, they had a connection to what we are about to read now. So this is not in the sense that we are going to now leave behind those seven congregations and move on into something completely different, but rather what we are now reading is something which uh, is very strongly connected to these congregations on the other side of the door. So we could say that the heavenly worship we, which we see, heavenly worship in, up there with our angels and archangels, it takes place parallel to the earthly worship. So in the sense that when we pray, they also pray. But probably even more close link is meant here. The worship on earth is not only happening side by side with the heavenly worship, rather it is connected into the heavenly worship. The heavenly worship includes and, and engulfs or, or takes into itself the, the little congregations in Asia through the door. When we pray, in the proper preface of the, of the uh, sacrament, together with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we Lord and magnify your glorious name. We are actually just confessing what Revelation 3, 4, and 5 are telling us. All right, so there is a door open and it's leading to heaven. So let's follow that. Uh, the fourth chapter. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like, the, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thank thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So if you remember, uh, caught the, 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 the elements we often see and listed in the, in the beginning about these uh, visions of heaven, Ezekiel and Isaiah, and it really is, uh, I'll give you a little home assignment, 
read Ezekiel 1 and read Isaiah 6 after this and, and, and sort of compare. There's many things which are similar. Um, it begins with an invitation. The first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And what, at once I was in the Spirit. This is a little bit interesting uh, turn of phrase. John says, the first voice uh, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet. I mean, he has been hearing Jesus speak all along the chapters 2 to 3. All along Jesus has been dictating a letter to John. And then he says, at the first voice. It's almost as if this is a different voice from the voice of Jesus he heard. Uh, speaking to like, him like a trumpet. The, the trumpet points to one, uh, the first chapter, 10th verse, I was in the Spirit and I heard a loud voice like a trumpet. And then John turns and he sees in the middle of the lampstands, Jesus. Now, if you read just the first chapter, it's kind of easy to assume that the voice he heard must be Jesus' voice, because Jesus is over there and he probably called him. But this it's not necessarily so, but this kind of assumes that it might be that the voice in the first chapter already was someone else and Jesus. And now again it's someone else and Jesus. Maybe the Holy Spirit himself. In the sense it would fit. Um, uh, that he, he calls, the Holy Spirit calls, and then Jesus is shown. Jesus is revealed to uh, John. And then here uh, in the... In the uh, fourth chapter leading into heavenly worship. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to recognize or name exactly who is who in Revelations, but that's, that's the thing. It's either Jesus or, or the Holy Spirit, I would say. They are saying the same anyways. And behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. Now this is... Uh, one of those words, when, when a Jewish reader especially, or anybody who is well familiar with the Old Testament uh, visions of God, when they hear throne, they know what is going to happen. Throne means the place where God is. It's, the power, it's a seat of power. Now we are dealing with God Almighty. In this case, you can say less is more. <laughs> like they sometimes say that the, the fact that John follows exactly what the prophets have done before him by not saying anything about the one on the throne, he is actually affirming that, yes, it is the Lord Almighty himself. Because that's how a prophet does. You don't go around saying too much things about the one on the throne. Because it's God Almighty who lives in an unapproachable light who never has, no one has ever seen or can see. So John simply says, I, there was a throne and one seated on the throne. And then he has this appearance of jasper and carnelian. It's, it's, like, it's like light shining and sparkling from the throne. But he doesn't see, see shapes, there's no head, there's no crown even. There's nothing like that you would imagine a king would have, no scepter no uh, pink slippers, nothing. It's just this radiance. And then a throne around, uh, uh, sorry, a, 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 a rainbow around the throne. Now that points to Ezekiel, who also sees a rainbow, or a, a shape like a rainbow, around God's throne. But also, what else in the, in the scripture especially points to rainbow? Noah. Exactly, Noah. Rainbow is the sign of the covenant. In, in some sense, it's the first sacrament, in the sense that it's a vis visible sign with attached promise in it. That when this bow is there, God says, I will remember the covenant with Noah, and I will not destroy the creation. And, and that's very fitting, because this chapter 4 is primarily it's the praise of God the Creator. This is a, a, a praise of God as the one who has created everything and keeps everything together. So then a, a little subtle reference to Noah and the covenant God made already then with his creatures, saying that I will sustain this creation, I will not destroy it anymore. 
it's kept there. Around the throne, now we get into more description, that the throne itself can be there. We will let that be in its, its majesty. But then we start seeing things really happening. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on them, uh, 20, uh, on, on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Who are these elders? There's a couple of possibilities how we can interpret the, the elders, and it, it seems to be something to do with the number. Quite common uh, way to explain this is that it's a combined number of the patriarchs and the apostles. The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the New Covenant, altogether 24. So it would be the picture of the God's people from Old Testament and New Testament. This is a possible interpretation. It could be linked very well with the vision of the New Jerusalem in chapter 21, with 12 gates and 12 foundations in the city wall. So again we see kind of this 24 over there. And then it's explained that it, in, in uh, New Jerusalem it is uh, the tribes and the apostles. Another interpretation could be to see the 24 elders as a symbol of the 24 divisions of priests in the Jerusalem temple. Now this is a little bit tricky stuff because you know we wouldn't really know too much about what's going on in the temple. But they had 24 classes or, or troops or divisions of, of Levitical priests in the temple, listed in 1 Chronicles 23. We know the temple in Jerusalem was a shadow of the heavenly temple, as Hebrew explains it. Uh, and you could maybe say that the priests in the temple on earth could have their correspondence in the heavenly throne room or the heavenly temple. If interpreted in this manner, then the 24 elders would be an image of the entirety of God's priesthood. That on earth you have these Levitical priests, in heaven you have 24 elders. Um, this seems to fit with what is said later in the 5th chapter, how Lamb has purchased from all nations his church to be uh, his priestly kingdom. So Christian's identity is linked with the priesthood they execute in the heavenly worship. Now, either way, actually, you kind of end in the same place. If you go with the idea of, of 12 uh, patriarchs and 12 apostles, or if you go with the idea of 24 uh, uh, divisions of, of priests, nonetheless, you have pretty much end up in the same place with the idea that these 24 uh, who, with their crowns and, and thrones, they symbolize God's people. They are God's, the entirety of God's people formed around his throne. Now, are these 24 signifying the ones and only the ones uh, who have already passed from this temporal life into eternal glory? You could say that they are surely them, but not only them. John was allowed to see the heavenly reality in a manner most Christians never get to do until, until the time comes when it's unveiled. So John only was able to see it, but all Christians are already partaking in it. The white robes they have are already mentioned quite many times in Revelation this far about Christians here on earth. In Sardis, um, they, they have some there who have not soiled their white robes. These robes are given by Jesus himself, also Jesus offers to Laodicea, that you should buy from me uh, a robe. And if you do a, just a quick word search through the Revelation, it seems that this robe is something... There's, there's actually... Uh, I'm now just quoting exegesis. There's two words for a robe or a garment. Uh, uh, and this, this hematoi, uh, or hematotion, which we have here, is usually in Revelation used as a garment of the militant church, of the, of the church that struggles here on earth against the temptations and, and the powers of evil. 
And then there is another word, stole, which speaks of the, 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 the sort of triumphant gowns, <laughs> you could say graduation gowns, uh, which those who enter in the glory receive. Uh, and when that comes up, we can talk about that more. And it's, it's always a little bit tricky if you can make too concrete theology about word search or concordance, but it seems that the Revelation makes a distinction between these two, that when they speak of hematoi, they speak of the church like Sardis, which is struggling here on earth, and when they speak of Stole, they speak of the, the vision of those who already have conquered and are there in heaven. So it might be that in these 24 elders, uh, we actually see a picture of the struggling church. They are not only the ones who have made it there, made it home, entered the glory through the pearl gates, and, and are there now. But it is John's vision that church already here on earth is grouped around the throne of God. They are meeting together with the whole angelic host of heaven in worship. And, and as you remember, this is not a video picture uh, of what it looks like in heaven. This is vision John received from God, and God wants to tell something through this vision. And it might be that he puts the picture of the church in this uh, throne room vision to show how the church already here on earth is connected with the divine realities, like again pointing to the door idea, that they have the door to heaven in their congregation. And if they open it, and if they allow it to be open, then the heavenly powers come in and they are brought up uh, into, into this reality we now read about. These elders have crowns. We know crowns are given to the one who conquers, especially to Philadelphia, and with the warning that no one should steal their crown. So they have also this, this ruling, and we come that, to that more later. <clears throat> From the throne came flashes of lightning, and rumblings, and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Lightnings and thunder are familiar from Old Testament prophetic visions. Fire, sometimes mentioned, for example, Daniel 7, uh, is get, gets a more personal nature now. It is the Holy Spirit already mentioned in, in the opening, when John sends uh, greetings from uh, and one is also from the seven spirits in front of God's throne. The task of the Holy Spirit is perhaps again shown here. Uh, before the throne burns seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So it is uh, the, the role of the Holy Spirit is to uh, signify the throne of God and illuminate it. So he is like a uh, blinking light there showing that here it is, here is God. That really is the prime job of the Holy Spirit, to always lead people to see God. As perhaps, if it, if it is correct that the, that the trumpet in the first chapter was Holy Spirit, then there it was again. He, he leads people to see Jesus. I have a question about the trumpet. Mm -hmm. um, could we perhaps in any way link that to the use of trumpets in the temple? I can't exactly remember off the top of my head how trumpets were used, just that there were trumpets. <laughs> Usually right before a festival or something like that. That's a good idea. I mean, trumpet is a, is a s way of signaling things. Right? Now, I, from the top of my head, I can't remember everything they did with trumpets in the temple, but it's true. The trumpet is signaling, and it might be something that that should be thought about as well, that the Holy Spirit is described like the voice of a trumpet, as the one who maybe calls, calls the people together. They didn't have church bells, but they had trumpets to signify the congregation that it was time to come to temple. So perhaps, maybe not. Maybe not impossible at all. 
particular idea. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now there is a sea. Sea again is a very strong biblical image especially in the Old Testament. What does sea signify? It's... Well, it signifies uh, danger and chaos. Yeah. Sea is the place where the monsters are, if you say. Sea is chaotic. Sea is always in movement. Uh, it's, it's dark. You can't see what's in the... The, 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 the pa pagan nations uh, around Israel were called the Sea of Nations, always ready to flood and, and, and attack uh, the Israel. The, the, the primal monsters live in sea, the behemoth and what are those. Uh, sea represents danger and sin, uh, partly because the Jews really were the seafaring people. <laughs> they were landlubbers, if ever they were any. And, well, in the Old Testament, there, aside from Noah, there's only two stories of Israelites going out to sea, and they both end poorly. One is Noah, and one is Jeroboam, who sends some sea, uh, ships out to do commerce, and they immediately sink. Right. Yeah, and then there's a story about, um, yeah, in the Jonah, and then everybody sinks. Yeah, that's right. There's not good, good examples of, of sea being your friend. So anyhow, uh, Sea is a, is a is a is a negative thing. It, it's it's we like sea. I miss sea when I uh, live here in Ontario. But for for biblical worldview or biblical language, sea is a bad thing. Beast arises from the sea in chapter thirteen. We see in Revelation. Uh, sea gives its dead at the end, apparently reluctantly, but it does. And in the New Jerusalem, there is no longer sea. Well, so sea is not something wonderful. But then this is a little bit of a different thing. It says, they were a sea of glass, like a crystal. It has been proposed that a sea of crystal or sea of glass means atonement of sin. That you take something which uh, otherwise might be destructive and through God's redeeming power it's it's turned into calm and clear so it would be a, a, a image of, of forgiveness and atonement the dark mysterious sea is made clear and transparent endless waves and storms have been calm <coughs> perhaps that's some way to interpret the term phrase but of course it also points again to Ezekiel, where we see that there is this uh, crystal-like firmament stretching above, and on top of that firmament is God's throne. So again, in Ezekiel, it is uh, uh, there to signify God's uh, presence. So that might be also, also one important reason why we see it here. There is four creatures, also known from Ezekiel 1. And also Daniel 7 makes a similar, although not actually connected, reference to four beasts arising in Daniel. Wings and eyes uh, are also familiar to the images from throne scenes in these Old Testament visions. They shout, shout of praise, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now when have we heard that before in Bible? Isaiah 6. That's what the 
uh, heavenly host is constantly singing. And where do we sing that in, in our service? We sing it in uh, Sanctus, just before communion, or during the communion liturgy. It's, it's probably not a, again, it's not a coincidence that, we, that the church does settle on singing Sanctus, holy, 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 in that point, rather than some other point. I mean, you could always sing holy, 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 but probably the early, early liturgists had some thought when they decided, let's sing Sanctus just before we sit down to eat with Jesus. However, all the earth is full of thy glory. That's what they sang in Isaiah. That's omitted. And if you are really careful and, and meticulous too, the, at this point you would realize that they, they lost one stanza. <laughs> or, the, or the, you skipped something. What happened to the whole, all oh, the earth is full of thy glory? Where did that go? Well, it's left out at this point because the hymn is actually finished only in the fifth chapter when it is sung to the Lamb. To the Lamb we, which we haven't yet seen, but we know it's coming. So then the hymn comes to an end. Again, a little subtle way John uses to show that the praise given to God is actually given also to Jesus. So the praise of Isaiah 6 is given also to Jesus. And that's, again, I'm just, you can tell Dr. Finger that I make these references to liturgy, so he will like it. Um, Again, this is a good point, what we do in our liturgy. Because we've actually, in, in, in Sanctus, we put together uh, also Hosanna, which is then sung to Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem. So, it's, that's again a way the Church confesses how the God of the Old Testament uh, is, the, is the Christ of the New Testament also. What are these four creatures then? That's again interesting question for interpretation. Four creatures, with the fa one with the face like a, uh, a lion, a second like an ox, a third with a man's face, and the fourth like an eagle in flight. Now, you might be willing to jump into the conclusion that these are the four evangelists, because we all know that Mark is symbolized by a, a, a lion, and uh, John by an eagle, Luke by a human and, and Matthew by an ox. But actually that's the other way around. The tradition of interpretation is to see, and uh, many in church have seen these four creatures as representative of the, of the four evangelists, and then because of that the church art shows the, the evangelists through these animals. So if you ever go to Venice, you see a lot of statues of lions over there because they think that they have marks bones in there, I think, if you remember correctly. Didn't they steal them from Amalfi? I think they did. Yeah, we visited in a honeymoon in Amalfi, and I think they originally had the bones of Evangelist Mark, but then Venice stole them. Yeah, don't trust those Venetians. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, but... Where did they have the bones in Venice? Yeah, so I don't know. Is, yeah, I don't know exactly. I've never been to Venice, but it's, it is symbol of the of Venice, the Republic of Venice is the lion. That, that's where they get it. So, um, okay, it might be for in, uh, for apostles, uh, for evangelists, simply because there's four. Okay, why not? Four often is uh, in in biblical. If you want to see meaning for numbers, four is usually the number of creation. The earth with four corners or four directions. Um, maybe, I think, maybe a better alternative than, than the evangelists, I would say, because this whole chapter is kind of characterized by God as creator. It would be possible to see these four creatures as representation of God's creation. Again, we are making the interpretation leap here. Uh, lion is the, is the king of the animals. He's the greatest of all predators. Uh, the, the ox is the strongest of animals, of domesticated animals. Uh, eagle is the, is the noblest of all birds, and man is simply the, the crown of creation. 
They are called living beings. That's how they are characterized. Four living beings. My hunch is that these four living beings around God's throne symbolize God's creation. They are aligned. They have animal features, or that one is not. He has human features. And they are characterized by number four, which is the, often, the, often the number of creation. So that's my, my guess. My guess is that they are here to represent God's entire creation, singing praise to the Creator. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So there, there it is, the, the emphasis on creation. It's God's creative work which brings forth this praise. Uh, he is praised through the first article of Greek. Worthy are you. Is not only speaking about God, uh, but also by implication rejecting all false gods. Not only is God worthy, but he is worthy in comparison to others. Only God, the creator of all things, is worthy of this worship. All others are mere idols. And this comes into contrast then later on in Revelation when we go forward and we encounter, for example, in Revelation chapter 13, all nations of the earth are worshipping the beast and its image. So you take that into contrast with this and you realize something is really wrong. That the earth is worshipping or the people are worshipping the beast when actually God alone, who is the true creator, is worthy of being uh, worshipped and praised. <clears throat> so... Let's keep that in, in mind, that the, the, the monotheism, the, the one God only of, of Jewish and Christian faith dictates with strongest possible terms that only God is worthy to be worshipped. And all other worship is not only vain, but actually blasphemous. To worship anything except God himself is an act of blasphemy. When we started talking about the sea, I just looked back to a description of the temple from First Kings. And in the temple, uh, Solomon's temple, there was a sea, and there was also a lot of statues of lions and oxen. I can't find anything about eagles. Oh, that's a very good point. It's, it's good to have students. Indeed, that's, my, that's a very good point. Again, we have now a third. Third possible interpretation of this. I'll write it down. Okay. And thus we conclude uh, chapter 5, which, oh, sorry, 4, which speaks of God as the creator, the one who is worthy of being praised. What's your uh, energy level, do you want to take a small break or, or go on? Go on. Go on. Yeah, let's get this over with. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go on then. Now we get into really exciting stuff. I hope you still have some, some energy left to take it, because now, uh, now things get dramatic, I would say. Uh, we come to the chapter 5. And let's read that as well. <clears throat> then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Let's stop there. Let's not go further. Let's stop, stop there for dramatic reasons. Uh, there is a right hand of God. We don't see anything ex uh, from the, the one on the throne except the right hand, and it has a scroll. Now, right hand of God is, a, again, a biblical expression. Uh, it means God's power, and especially God's uh, providence, or God's uh, saving or guarding power over his people, Israel. It is with the might of his right hand. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Uh, we read in Exodus 15. And throughout the Old Testament, uh, it is referred to God's right hand as the hand which gives deliverance to God's people. Would it be fair to say, then, that the idea that Jesus is somehow stuck at God's right hand and he is in heaven and therefore can't get on earth because God's right hand is in heaven is not only erroneous in the fact that it assumes that God's hand is a place, but also erroneous in the fact that God's hand is, in fact, primarily demonstrated on earth and not in heaven. Oh, good point. Yeah, God's right hand is always in action. That's mm -hmm. true. It's not just just there. God's right hand is doing work, uh, especially for his people. And when Christ is seated, God's right hand, that's, that's a good point. Uh, so when you see a scroll in God's right hand, I mean, he could have just said there was a scroll, or he could have said there was a scroll in his hand, but he says it was in his right hand. I think it's, it's significant. To see a scroll in God's right hand signifies his wondrous plan for the good of his people. Now, seals. Don't, I don't know, do we still have seals? Yes. I mean, I know you do them when you, for example, made the copies of our passport. Do we have seals with the sort of legal sense that they are broken and then they are not broken, or? No, no, no not that sense. What about records that are sealed? Is that not, is that just a, That's just an expression. expression? Yeah. Right. Back in the day, seal was a pretty important thing. To seal a document means uh, that it's not allowed to be opened unless by the person who has the authority to see, open it. And you know, you, you could, and the thing is that when you break the seal, you can't fix it anymore. So if you receive a letter in the post and you see, hey, the seal is broken, you know somebody has been tampering with your mail and then there's going to be consequences. Uh, or even you could say if, if, if it's an official document and somebody breaks the seal without, then it's void. Because it's possible that they might actually alter the document. So it really is important that who gets to open the seals. It's not just that anybody could do it. Uh, and, and therefore, this question of who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals is a real good question. It's not self-evident that anybody could go with a pen knife and, and start opening them. It has to be the right person. Otherwise, whatever is in there might be considered void, it might be unlawful, it could be punishable if, if you break it without permission. It really is a big thing. When you read about, uh, in Matthew, when, when they bury Jesus in the tomb and then Pilate sends uh, and, and, and seals the tomb, the, the seal is not going to keep anybody out. It's not that hard to break a seal as a physical feat, but it means if you break it, you're going to duck. Because some, if you break it, you're rising in rebellion against the person who put the seal there. So it's really a big thing. Sorry, Daniel, oh, what I was going to say was not very serious. I was just going to say as a modern day example that sometimes electronics uh, in order to prevent you from opening them, we'll have a seal that if you break it, you uh, have avoided the warranty. Mm. Well, maybe that's true. It's still saying the same thing. If you break it, you leave a mark. Okay, so the question is that who is worthy to open? Uh, open the seal. Who is uh, uh, ready to open the scroll? Uh, what we see, it, it's seven seals. Often in Roman law, seven seals were used to uh, seal a will. So it's not just a message from someone to someone, but probably this scroll 
contains instructions or orders so that when it's opened there is a will that, which is executed there is something that starts to happen uh, when, when it's put into motion no one on earth uh, in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it the fact that John begins to weep loudly when no one gets to open the scroll it's, it's saying something about what John expects to find in the scroll now when we go forward and then we start reading about breaking of the seals maybe you've gone there already and you know what's coming. There's going to be all sorts of hot and cold stuff coming down from heaven and, and people are going to be waiting and all that. So you would imagine that no one in the same mind would exactly expect or look forward to getting this, this <clears throat> scroll of pestilence open. <clears throat> but the fact that John is weeping because the scroll is not open, it gives us a very important uh, a key of interpretation to everything that follows. Again, it is something good. That's pretty much as simple as you can put it. To open the scroll and to break its seals is something good. John wants to see it happen. And when he gets the feeling that it won't happen, he's going to be, cr he's crushed, he's weeping loudly, like a baby screams uh, because he thinks that this wonderful, wonderful scroll will go on unopened. So that's a good uh, key of interpretation that whatever we encounter later on is uh, part of God's great, beautiful uh, plan. I was going to say, if it's a will, then do we see it as perhaps the new covenant? Perhaps, perhaps, I don't know necessarily if it means that it's a new covenant, but it means more like God has a, a, a yeah, you could say New Testament, but in the sense that God has uh, dictated a plan or given a command that in the case this letter is open, then this is what will happen. Then we see, or hear, uh, the, the elder say, <clears throat> uh, weep no more behold the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals lion of Judah that refers not uh, the emperor of Haile Selassie from Ethiopia even though he was called lion of Judah by the Rastafaris it refers to Genesis 49 uh, where Judah, the, the one tribe of Israel, one of the patriarchs, is called a uh, young lion. And root of David pops up, for example, in Jeremiah 23 or 33. In general, we see in the Old Testament this idea of a root or a shoot. That's why they call him Nazarene. Uh, Nether being like an offshoot from a, a stump. Uh, a root or a shoot is throughout the Old Testament a messianic symbol. Isaiah 11, 53, he grew like a, a, a shoot or how do, you, how do you call it? A root, something. Uh, Zechariah 3, it's, it's showing how Messiah will rise from Israel, even as a small shoot rises from the ground. So calling uh, him the root of David emphasizes the full humanity of Jesus, that he is root of David, he comes from David's line, he comes from this family lineage. He has conquered, Jesus has conquered, and that's a good reference to the chapters 2 to 3, uh, who always, uh, the letters to congregations end with this saying, he who conquers, well who is the one who conquers? Well Jesus certainly is the one who conquers, he is the one who has conquered, and therefore, he can open the scroll, and it is through his victory that Christians in seven churches gain their victories, or lose them, if they reject Jesus. Now, this is where we go. Now, the, the, you could say the tension is at its top. 
there is a scroll John knows contains something magnificent. And it looked for a moment that it could not be opened, but then he hears there is a lion of Judah, the conqueror, the power. He is worthy, he has won, he is able to open it. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, with, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. What happened to the lion? What happened to the lion? This is, you could say, I, I love this, this moment. John thinks he's going to see a lion, and he sees a lamb. And this is so capturing the Christian experience of, of how we hope or expect to see the Lion of Judah. But we are given the Lamb. And not just any kind of Lamb, it's, it's Lamb which looks like it's just being cut open. It's all bloody and, and mess. It's not exactly a victorious picture of the conqueror. You know, lion could be. A lion is, you know, Aslan and, and king of the savannah and with claws and teeth. But lion, uh, uh, lamb, lamb is not not a conqueror. But that's exactly how John is shown. The Christ is shown to John. Okay, it comes the time of White Rider with the with the sword coming out from his mouth and his uh, his uh, clothes deep in blood. But that's still uh, fifteen chapters later. Not yet. Now we see a lamb, and that's how the church sees. And he, the lamb, went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And then the congregation said one last time, this is the feast of the victory of the Lord. <laughs> yes. yes, that's right. One of the central themes of Revelation is comparison between figures. We have very interesting pairs uh, in Revelation. We have, uh, we have the harlot of Babylon. We have uh, the woman in, in chapter 12, who gives birth and with the stars around her head, the bride of Christ and the heart of Babylon. We have New Jerusalem, we have Babel, the city of, of sin and extortion. Uh, we have others, and the most striking comparison would be the dragon and the lamb, or the lamb and the priests. It's uh, the devil and his cohort, the unholy trinities, depicted ferocious and powerful, you know. Dragon eats lambs for breakfast, many. <laughs> and, and, and beasts. And, and against them is standing a lamb. Not a good ratio for, for bedding. But that's, that's the picture 
the, the people who received the revelation had. They were a small, little insignificant churches standing up to the greatest nation probably in the history of the world, uh, at least in the, in the Western history of the world, the Roman Empire, saying, yeah, we don't think your, your emperor is such a big shot after all. We have a better God. And what are these people, these little seven congregations, doing that? They are like a lamb in front of a dragon. And so, so Revelation has these delicious, you could say, delicious tensions or, or correlations between two figures which we follow and, and here we are introduced to the first one of them to the land and then later on we get to see the, uh, the beasts and everything when they come. Uh, what is weak in this world that God has chosen in order to bring to shame that which is strong? 1 Corinthians 1, 27. The land, however, is not dead. It might be a Land, but it's and it might look like it's being slaughtered, but it's still standing, it's living. And you could maybe say that this is the image of a lamb who was slaughtered but came back to life. It's all covered in blood, uh, but it's standing. And what's actually very interesting is where it is standing. It is standing in the middle of the throne. Here, I gotta say, I usually don't do this. But I gotta say, here the translations are not that great. Uh, what the English Standard Version says is um, between the throne and the four living creatures. And that's not what the Greek says. The Greek says in the middle of the throne and the four living creatures. And that's interpreted often, often the, uh, the translator interprets that to mean that it's between these things. But that's not literally what the Greek says. It sees in the middle of the throne. And, and that's, that's important because there is a theological point here. There's a huge theological point here, which is actually coming not just in this point, but generally. So if you think about the throne, throne is the place of God. No one sits on the throne except God. But here we have land. Land is in the middle of the throne, smack in the middle of it all. It's saying something about Jesus. We, we heard he's the, he's the true son of David. He's okay. He's fully human. But he's sitting there in the middle of God's glorious throne like he owns the place, which he actually does because he is God himself. And also, this is where, where, where John beautifully breaks the tradition of prophetic vision because normally in the Old Testament you don't look into the temple, uh, into the throne. There is nothing for you to see there. There is only God in his, his uh, full glory which you cannot comprehend. But now he sees the one on the throne, the Lamb. He sees actually something there. So that which previously was impossible to see or comprehend God who dwells in unapproachable light, which no one has ever seen or can see, <coughs> now has been seen and is seen in Jesus Christ. So, so beautifully John breaks from the tradition of the Old Testament um, prophets because now something has changed. God has become a man. God has become a visible, tangible, touchable thing. God has become something you can see. So, so it really changes the game now. Now how this lamb is then described is <clears throat> he has seven horns and seven eyes, which if you've seen pictures of this lamb, it, they, you know, when people draw too literally, it looks like a monster. <laughs> this seven eyes, it, it, it's pretty horrible looking. I think this is again a point where we are dealing with, with uh, symbols and images. You remember, uh, seven is a, a, a symbol of perfection, of divine, uh, absolute perfection. A uh, horn is a very often recurring Old Testament image of power, 
For example, Deuteronomy 23, 1 Kings 22, and so on. Uh, horn is a power. It's, a, it's an image of power. And, and lamb with seven horns is a lamb with absolute power. It looks like very insignificant thing, a lamb, but it actually has the marks of full divine sovereignty, full power. Uh, the seven eyes, probably reference to Zechariah 4, also speaking of God's seven eyes. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, let's, let's read that, it's so, so wonderful. Uh, Zechariah 4. <clears throat> Whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. I love this day of small things. That's what we often uh, quoted in, in Finland when we were starting our little mission diocese and had one or two or three or four congregations and in the first divine service there were 20 people and then you just remember do not despise the day of small things or small beginnings and God provided growth and, and it's speaking about God's seven eyes uh, that they are keeping watch when they are building the, the temple uh, they shall uh, uh, see the whole world uh, in, in Zechariah. Uh, these seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. So in Christ's uh, image here when he is shown as the one with seven eyes uh, refers to God's knowledge and perhaps his operation of spirit on earth that God's, Christ sees everything that is happening and his seven horns testify of the absolute power he has. So indeed, this lamb then goes and takes the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Uh, it's taken from the hand of the Father, it is opened by Jesus himself. All of this takes place in God's <coughs> throne room in the midst of his service. Uh, the rest of the revelation must be seen through this reality. Everything we read after this is proceeding from God's own court. So it's again referring to the first session when we spoke about whose revelation it is. It is revelation of Jesus. It reveals Christ to us. It's not a revelation of Antichrist. It's not a revelation of the devil. It's not probably even a revelation of the end of the world. It is a revelation of God. Uh, it shows that. And, and the, whatever starts to roll from here on, it, it comes from God's own throne room. So that's the message uh, the Christian reader gets. Everything is in control. Everything is governed by God. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. They filmed up. They worshipped. Again, pointing to Christ's true, true divinity. Because in the end of the chapter 4, everybody was falling down around God, the Creator, and saying, worthy are you to receive uh, honor and praise and thanks. And then almost now the same words. They fall down in front of the Lamb and worship Him and, and sing the same song to Him. And this really is... If you have Jehovah's Witnesses coming over and you want to discuss with them about is Jesus Christ truly God, you can read this part. It shows this, all this heavenly host worshipping him, and we know no one else can be worshipped than God himself. 
And here they go. So, especially in God's own throne room, uh, it would be unspeakable or unimaginable that they could worship anything except God himself. Uh, they have golden bowls full of incense. We encounter this again later in the chapter 8, uh, the, the incense-bearing angel with the prayers of the saints. Uh, incense is a symbol of prayer already in the Old Testament. How does it go in the psalm? Let my prayer rise before you like incense. It's depicting the pleasant smoke or pleasant aroma rising to God. And who are these saints? These are the Christian people who pray. Their prayers are filling the censers in heavenly worship. So already, saints on earth are joined in the service in heaven around the land. These are singing the new song. Uh, Jewish people had a tradition of speaking about ten songs of Moses. First, taking place on the shore of the Red Sea, after they were delivered from Pharaoh, and then saying that the final tenth song will come when the Israel is redeemed. So that's the, the tenth song which they are still expecting. Isaiah 42 encourages, sing to the Lord a new song. Now that's again a theological thing. No wonder it finds its way into our liturgy. Now the content of this thing is revealed. There is a message and, and, and content to that new song they sing. It's not just any new song. It's a song of praise for Jesus Christ, especially for his atoning sacrifice. Uh, you are worthy for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. The scroll can be opened because Jesus has suffered death for God's people. Again shows how the scroll in the right hand is a scroll of God's saving plan, not his uh, plan of doom and destruction. It's clearly said that you can open this scroll because you gave your life to redeem to God, his own people. So, you could say, we could perhaps say that uh, if Christ had not died, there would be some sort of an end to the world, but it would not be this scroll. It would be some totally different scroll. But only because Christ has given his life, shed his blood, to atone humankind. Only for that reason can this scroll be opened. And what unfolds then is God's plan of salvation and his mercy. Now, it's said about these uh, elders. No, sorry, not about the elders, but you have ransomed people for God. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Christians shall reign on the earth. Now that is not the same thing as what earthly rulers do. Presidents and monarchs and all that. Uh, Jesus actually says quite clearly in Matthew 20 to his disciples that you know, uh, that the rulers of nations govern them with power and so on, and this is not how it should be among you, but he who is the greatest should be the servant of others. And when he is interrogated by Pilate, Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. If it had been, then my disciples would have fought for me, but it's not from this world. So Jesus says clearly that his kingdom is not political realm. And therefore, when, the, uh, when he has redeemed for himself a kingdom and priests um, that shall reign the earth, it's not speaking about establishing a political governance which somehow starts to control the, the, the nations of the earth, but rather it uh, brings a spiritual rule of grace and faith. Now, if you want... Another example of how this kind of ruling can be seen, it's, it's 
from the other viewpoint, Romans 5 and 17. And this is, some Christians do think that there will be uh, a, a visible earthly government of Christians who then will keep everybody in check uh, and, and rule. And I don't think that is true. Uh, let's, uh, in Romans 5, 17, uh, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now, it's, Paul says that death reigned. Well, he doesn't mean that death had some sort of a nation or government or land to his own, uh, himself. Actually, death was everywhere reigning. So it's the same kind of thing that life in Christ will reign everywhere. And his kingdom of priests will reign on earth as a spiritual kingdom of grace. And then we come to the final, uh, final triumph. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So again we see how uh, to the Lamb is given the same honor and glory and might as to the God the Father. Power, might, honor, glory and blessing. Uh, already in the previous chapter when praising God the Creator, these are mentioned. Now we here added wealth and wisdom, altogether giving seven characteristics or seven reasons of praise. Again, a little bit of a number thing there. Uh, full, complete, utter, absolute, divine perfection uh, of, of praise. Perhaps riches may refer to him who purchased nations to himself with his blood. And he is given wisdom. He is wisdom, like Proverbs 9 speak of the wisdom of God almost as a person, which is often seen as the prefigure of Christ. All the creatures on heaven and earth and under the earth worship the Lamb not just the ones in heaven. So it's on the earth and under the earth, worshipping the Lamb. And this again shows how Revelation is also the book for the militant church, the struggling church here on earth, showing how the whole church on earth, not just the ones already in heaven, uh, break forth in praise to the Lamb. That's us also included in that vision. So there, there we come to the finale of uh, chapter 5. And next time did we then go into the seven seals and, and those rather catastrophic visions we see with trumpets and, and, and such. And we try to make some sense of that. But let, let, that, let this be the strong foundation for everything which happens in Revelation afterwards. That it is, it is heavenly worship, it is God's plan of salvation for his people, uh, and we already, as Christians, through the life of our congregations, especially through the Lord's body and blood, are included in this heavenly feast of praise and thanksgiving. All right, any concluding questions or comments? Thank you very much for your attention. Next week we will continue then.